Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We will start uh, the discussion, the event, shortly, um, within two minutes. So please wait a moment. We will start at 1.15. Thank you very much. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Please welcome to the eighth series of Indonesia Environment Talks with the topic Stockholm Plus 50, Youth as Enabler Stakeholder for Sustainable Living. First and foremost, I would like to welcome His Excellency Insinyur Sarwono Kusuma Atmaja, former Minister of Administrative Reform, former Minister for Environment, and former Minister for Marine and Fisheries Affairs. Also to Dr. Mahawan Karuniasa, the CEO of, of Environment Institute, and also the Chairman of the Indonesia Expert Network on Climate Change and Forestry, and the Chairman of the Alumni Association School of the Environmental Science University of Indonesia. And also to our speakers for today, Craig Duncan, students of Murdoch University, Claire Wu, students of Australian National University, Stevie Leonard Harrison, student of University of Indonesia, Fajar Munik Putranto, Environmental Specialist of Environment Institute. And of course, I would like also welcome all audiences across Indonesia, Australia, and Pakistan. Thank you for joining us on this special occasion. Let me introduce myself. My name is Maria Oktora, and I feel so honored to, to be your master ceremony as well as moderator for today. Hopefully we could have a constructive and fruitful discussions. This webinar is held by the Environment Institute in collaboration with the Alumni Association School of Environmental Science University of Indonesia, APIC Indonesia Network, and the Australian Consortium for In-Country Indonesia Studies, or ACICIS. This webinar will be uncovering the perspective of both Australia and Indonesian youth, focusing on how young generation could play eminent role as the enabler stakeholder for sustainable living. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, before we move forward to the discussion panel, we will start with the welcoming speech from Dr. Mahawan Karuniasa. Dr. Mahawan Karuniasa has a notable role in building climate change awareness in Indonesia. Dr. Mahawan is also the chairman for the Indonesia Expert Network on Climate Change and Forestry, a founder of Environment Institute, the initiator of this event. 
Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Dr. Mahawan Karuniasa for a welcoming speech. To Dr. Mahawan, the screen is yours. Please, Pak. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Maria. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya. Salam kebajikan. In this opportunity, on behalf of Environment Institute, in collaboration with um, APIC Indonesia Network, APIC Indonesia Network is Indonesian expert network on climate change and forestry, and also in co collaboration with Alumni Association of School of Environmental Science, University of Indonesia. Would like to thanks to, uh, of course, to Bapak Sarwono Kusuma Atmaja, environmental figure and chairman of the Advisory Council for Climate Change and the Ministry of Environment and Forestry that will convey keynote speech in this webinar. And also uh, thank you for all participants that uh, attend uh, this uh, webinar. Also in this opportunity, I would like to thank uh, so much to all youth speaker and moderators uh, that already together with us, Craig and Claire from Australia, Steve, a speaker from Indonesia, and also Maria, a student uh, from Indonesia, and uh, Fajar Muni uh, from Environment Institute. Also, uh, thanks to the Australian Consortium for In-Country Indonesia Studies, or ACCs, which is a non-profit consortium of universities uh, that allow this, especially these two best students, Craig and Claire from Australia to participate in this uh, webinar. And also thank you to the dream team of uh, Environment Institute, Kriston, Anita, Indah, and Wetness that minutes all detail in this uh, preparation and also during this organization of this event. With this, uh, please welcome to the Indonesia Environment uh, Series 8 and hoping this uh, webinar will provide ideas and impact at national and global efforts to face triple planetary crisis, including climate change, pollution and waste, uh, natural degradation, and biodiversity loss by raising the role of youth as enabled stakeholders in transforming into sustainable living. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahawan, uh, for your welcoming speech. And distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for us to have here with us His Excellency Insinyur Sarwono Kusumat Maja. Mr. Sarwono is a prominent figure in Indonesia, especially related to the environmental sector. Currently, Mr. Sarwono is playing a significant role as a chairman of the Advisory Board on Climate Change Policies at the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, as well as being actively engaged in various civil society organizations in the field of environment, capacity building, and education. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome the keynote speech from His Excellency Insinyur Sarwono Kusumaat Maja. Sir, please, the screen is yours. Uh, thank you, moderator, and thank you to Pak Mahawan Karuniasa from the Environment Institute and partners for inviting me to speak at this uh, webinar to address uh, a, a very interesting topic, Youth as Enabling Stakeholder for Sustainability, Review and Future Outlook for Indonesia. Uh, next, please. As uh, a start of this review, I'd like to go back to the year 1978, following the UN Stockholm Conference on the Human Environment. At that time, uh, in 1978, uh, Professor Emil Salim, a well-known economist was appointed as the State Minister for Development, Supervision, and Environment. And subsequently, for the next 10 years until 1993, he became the State Minister for Population and Environment. 
and it was a daunting challenge for anyone to be the Minister of Environment at that time, since uh, he had to address an unknown public policy issue, which was widely seen as an imposition from outside forces. Now, given the authoritarian nature of the New Order regime, Professor Emil Salim's position became unique. On one hand, his mandate to mainstream environment issues was looked at with skepticism and of, often open hostility by New Order stalwarts. But on the other hand, it also opened opportunities for him to become closely related to the academia and youth groups, communities who claimed they were independent entities. Next, please. Assiduously, with great perseverance and eloquence, Professor Emil Salim utilized this window of opportunity to establish new alliances using environment as a common ground by taking steps such as establishing environment study centers at universities, establishing program-driven policies leading to a regulatory framework, as well as uh, providing opportunities for youth groups to engage in training and to organize themselves in various societal entities. And uh, you have here shown, yeah, uh, an example of the uh, one of the university study centers at the uh, Institute of Technology at Bandung. It, it was established in 1979. Next. I succeeded Professor Emil Salim in 1993 after five years uh, in the cabinet as Minister for Administrative Reform. I had a high appreciation for the foundations of environmental governance established by Professor Emil Salim and decided to continue in his path and to introduce strengthening the administrative and enforcement capacities in the Environment Ministry. Realizing the need to embrace the independent stakeholders comprising of youth, academia and the media I then launched a tactical maneuver to win hearts and minds, so to speak, uh, by uh, the following steps. The first is by targeting errant business entities, making use of uh, program-driven policies, which by then had entered a regulatory stage. And then uh, for that purpose, the newly established Environmental Impact Management Agency was equipped with uh, compliance tools. My term of office from 1993 and 1998 saw the emergence of a major crisis, namely ma massive forest fires, which lasted from August 1997 to early 1998. Next. In spite of warning, about the impending prolonged dry season issued by President Suharto in December 1999, the government uh, chose uh, not to heed him. So his uh, warning was uh, ignored. The long dry season, uh, known as the El Nino phenomenon, was seen by the government as an opportunity to embark on land clearing done by a burning forest to pave the way for plantations and to open the way uh, to, uh, to open uh, new paddy fields. The Minister of Forestry at that time, Mr. Jamaluddin Suryo Hadikusumo, realizing the gravity of the situation, embarked on a corrective action, cancelling land clearing permits for forest areas uh, in his jurisdiction. Next. So the Ministry of Environment, together with the Ministry of Forestry at that time, found ourselves in isolation as the rest of the country, including the media in the first days of the crisis, went on a denial mode. The situation was made worse by a decision to clear 
800,000 hectares of prime peatlands in central Kalimantan to make way for agriculture. Faced with uh, these formidable challenges, I proceeded to provide government agencies with reports and predictions of fire outbreaks, as well as designing a satellite-based monitoring, monitoring system. Remarkably, these efforts were supported and manned by volunteers from government agencies and the private sector, as well as uh, youth groups, of course. Everyone involved was acting in personal capacity, including members of the armed forces, after a call for volunteers was made. Youth organizations such as the Ansar Youth Movement, affiliate of the Nahdlatul Ulama, Wanadri, a forester youth group, and a number of NGOs pitched in, all working alongside my staff at the Environmental Management impact management agency uh, next massive forest fires mon monetary crisis and loss of support forced president suharto to resign in 1998 leading the way for a far-reaching political re reform towards a full-fledged democracy i shall not deal with the role of youth in these times of major political changes since the environment management was not the issue of the day next let me move fast forward to address the future outlook for indonesia on sustainability starting with the era of president jokowi elected in 2014. a strategic decision by president jokowi was the merger of environment and forestry into one entity which is the ministry of environment and forestry this decision placed uh, forestry management within the paradigm of sustainability. The president's decision was followed up by the Minister of Environment and Forestry, Professor Siti Nurbaya Bakar, as she embarked on consolidation measures comprised of um, correction, corrective actions, as well as uh, policy coherence. Next. As such, a moratorium of palm oil expansion and peatlands exploitation were imposed. In exchange, sustainable management of forests was encouraged, leading to emergence of social forestry, refinement, refinement of uh, ecosystem restoration, and other new forms of sustainability-related forestry and environmental projects. These were seen uh, sprouting up, as can be discerned, through the spread of new new and actually actually actual sighting of uh, new ways of uh, doing business individuals companies and com communities were seen discussing and practicing unheard of concepts such as permaculture locavore circular economy urban waste urban farming, sorry, waste ut utilization uh, ventures and others uh, such as indoor farming, uh, agroforestry, su sustainable ag agroforestry, and a lot of uh, combinations of those uh, uh, techniques. To the left, you will see indoor farming being practiced by PT Centra Pangan Indonesia, whose CEO Mr. Mushab Nursantyo is only 27 years old. That shows you an example on how youth you know, can be a very creative force yeah, in, uh, as an enabling stakeholder of sustainability. Next. However, a new set of constraints emerged as follows. The acceleration of climate change became increasingly evident. The second is that COVID-19 COVID uh, virus disease, first detected in Wuhan, quickly became a, a global pandemic. All forms of armed conflicts persisted, followed by escalation as warfare between states erupted. And uh, we are now worried 
whether nuclear war would erupt, uh, you know, as a as a trend uh, to be feared of in the future. And then in, in the co context of the three items above, abuse of digital technology shows uncertainty and distress in all fields of human endeavors. Although, admittedly, as we all know, uh, digital technology has its merits and it can be very useful and very meaningful in order to improve our lives, improve our businesses. But in terms of uh, the um, the uh, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity of today, uh, then uh, we also have to be aware of the negative sides of digital technology. Disruptions in many fields of human activities is now taking place with alternatives, with alternatives uh, remaining elusive yet yeah. the situation is often described as hookah volatile uncertain complex ambiguous or bunny yeah, brittleness and then uh, what's the a uh, anxiety and non-linearity non and incomprehensibility next what are the prospects for Indonesia? Uncertainties uh, being keenly felt today, as exemplified by the Fuka Bani phenomenon, will uh, befall every nation not accepting Indonesia. Sources of inner strength within the Indonesian society will have to be found, cherished, and given ro a role to negotiate the difficult road of recovery in the future. Here are some of the possible sources of strength. The first is demographic dividend. Indonesia is now starting to enter a period where the majority of our people would be of productive age. And this is a, a once in a lifetime opportunity for any country. And, and since uh, it is so, uh, then uh, attention to make use of this uh, demographic dividend would be very crucial in order to ensure a useful and meaningful role for the Indonesian uh, youth as enabling stakeholder of sustainability. The second is unity in diversity. Indonesia has a very uh, complex and uh, diverse uh, society, perhaps one of the most diverse in the world. And ironically, it's be because it is a, a diverse uh, community, we also cannot break up. Yeah. We are too diverse to be broken. And it has been proven time and time again during our history of independence for the past uh, 77 years that we have always overcome problems uh, within our society regarding our diversity by ending up uh, united even stronger. Uh, and then, in spite of having experienced losses in natural resources, much of these resources are ready to be rehabilitated and recovered. In the longer term, usage of re renewable energy would be ready to be implemented after the intricate uh, energy transition has been gone through. Next. Therefore, on the ruins of Buka and Bani, with the demographic uh, dividend in place, <clears throat> young people of Indonesia are ready to sow the seeds of the future. And as such, the present flagship program at the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, namely the Folu Natsing 2030, will hopefully be successful to coincide with the peak of the said demographic dividend. Thank you.
Thank you very much, sir, for your uh, quite inspiring uh, keynote speech. Um, it's a quite interested uh, that since a long time ago, actually, Indonesia has progressing uh, so many strategy towards sustainability. Uh, the interested one, uh, we could highlight it, how uh, Mr. Sarwono put a tactic, tactical maneuver uh, called as Win Heart and Minds, and also uh, the step also have uh, undertaken, such as moratorium of palm oil expansions and peatlands exploitation, exploitation were imposed. Many sustainable strategy also uh, have been undertaken uh, and also have been integrated from sustainable forestry to sustainable agriculture. However, um, there is so many uh, obstacles that uh, we are still uh, facing, such as accelerations of climate change, uh, also global pandemic, COVID-19 virus, um, armed conflict, abuse of digital technology, especially in uh, disruptions in many fields of human uh, activities uh, that uh, uh, introduced uh, to us by Mr. Sarwono called uh, Fuka and Bani. Fuka is a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, and Bani, brittleness, anxiety, nonlinearity, incomprehensible. However, Indonesia are now still optimists with um, uh, many opportunities, uh, especially uh, with regard to the demographic dividends, and hopefully with this demographic dividends, uh, we could um, we could uh, improve uh, the things that uh, need to be uh, further developed uh, with regard to the environmental uh, development. Again, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pak Sarwono, for your knowledgeable uh, keynote speech. This thing is, ladies and gentlemen. Um, let's move forward to uh, the first speakers. Um, Maria, we, I'm sorry. Yeah, yes. Uh, let's take photos first. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> sorry for overlooking <laughs> the, yeah. This is important, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We would like to take a picture together, uh, especially we already have here our uh, distinguished uh, Keynote speakers, Mr. Sarwono Kusumat Maja. So everyone, please turn on your camera. Uh, we will take a picture together. Um, Mas Pajar, could you lead the uh, session? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please turn on your camera and smile. I will count one, two, three. One, two, three, okay. Yeah, once again, uh, this has uh, three pages. <laughs> and then one, two, three, okay. And the last one, uh, pardon me. Okay. Yeah, there, and one, two, three, smile. Okay, thank you, over to you, Mbak Maria. Okay, thank you very much, Mas Fajar. Again, thank you very, uh, very much, Pak Sarwono, uh, for your uh, time today. And distinguished ladies and gentlemen, today uh, we have four inspiring speakers from the young generations. As today's topic will be highlighted the role of the young generation as an enabler stakeholder for sustainable living. As I introduced earlier, we already have here Craig Duncan, Claire Wu, Stevie Leonard Harrison and Fajar uh, Munik Putranto. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you all to raise a question to all the speakers. Uh, and also, if you have any question as well for uh, His Excellency um, Insinyur Sarwono Kusumat Maja, we are very much welcome as well. Um, if you have any questions, you may uh, raise your question in the chat box and I will deliver your questions in uh, Q&A sessions. You also may proceed with your question in Bahasa Indonesia. 
distinguished ladies and just gentlemen. As for the first speakers, we have Craig Duncan. He is a double degree student in creative media um, and photography and journalism at Murdoch University. He is actively engaged in environmental issues and through his work, he was able to cover issues ranging from a declining populations of little penguins to the destructions of possums and cockatoo habitats. It's interesting. Hi, Duncan. Greg, how are Hello. you? I'm very well. How are you? <laughs> okay, great. Are you ready to share your thoughts today with us? Yes, I am. Okay, great. Okay, this is ladies and gentlemen. Without further ado, let's welcome Craig Duncan. Uh, Craig, please, the screen is yours. Can everyone see what I've got up? Yes, we can see. Awesome. Cool. So yes, um, today I'm going to be talking about youth photojournalism and our actions we can have towards environmental sustainability. So I just first I'd like to just thank everyone for being here and thank you for the opportunity. It's very cool to talk to an entire audience of Indonesian people from Australia. It's weird, but neat. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the fact that both me and Claire are in Australia, and I'm sure we hopefully have some other Australians with us as well. So we'll acknowledge the First Nation people that I've learned through my time with this program actually have a much longer history than just then we have a much longer history with Indonesia than we originally thought. <laughs> No, yes. Today I'm going to be looking. <laughs> I'm going to be looking at um yeah, youth and photojournalism. So without further ado, let's just ask the question of what is photojournalism? And simply put, it is the merger of photography and journalism. So journalism has the 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 expectation most of the time it's meant to be truthful, it's meant to be unbiased, it's meant to have a reason to exist. Now, if you were here for the last webinar that the Environment Institute did, you'll know it was all about fake news and how it is easily corruptible. But then photography in its own right does not have to be real. It doesn't have to have any meaning. It can be completely artistic. For example, a picture of a cat can be nothing more than a picture of a cat. It doesn't have to have meaning or it could be an entirely fake picture. But photojournalism, I like to think, is held above all of that. It is usually has to be real. You can't fake photos if you're trying to pass them as journalism they have to be the real deal and i think that alone gives it a much better place in society than just journalism and photography in general a good example of this i find is this photo by nicasso cortinez he did of the Syrian war in 2013 as you can see at the top his original image he actually photoshopped out a camera in the bottom and his excuse for doing this was it's, it's a camera, it's distracting from the overall picture, it doesn't have to be there, so I'm going to remove it. But the people who published this photo, Associated Press, thought, this isn't acceptable. A camera like that on the floor changes this scene entirely. It goes from a heroic scene of a man climbing over the trenches to what looks like a film set. And the photographer who took this was a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer, so top of his game, and he was fired. Completely kicked out, lost his job, because of changing this one small part of his photo. And that in itself just shows how infallible photos have to be and how truthful they have to be when it comes to these things. And when we look at environmental issues, how much they can have an impact. So there's a weird quote that I don't remember who said it, but it was, if you're ever photographing a war, you don't show the horrors of it, you show a child's shoe sitting in the dirt. And I think when it comes to photography and things and the environmental issues, nothing says that better than images like this. So this is a brown pelican covered in oil as a result of the BP oil spill. And as I said, you don't show the actual inferno of the oil spill, you show the casualties of that. And the casualties in this instance are the animals and the environment. Uh, my next image is much more, much more confronting. There's a video that accompanies this, which I do not suggest you watch because it made me cry. It's um, a starving polar bear in the north of Canada. And there's an accompanying video that starts with the words, this is what the face of climate change looks like. And it really, it cannot convey better what an image of how much these animals are suffering as a result to us. The one thing with photography and journalism, it can be infallible. For example, this image isn't entirely true because the area this pet polar bear lives in normally doesn't have ice on it in summer when this photo was taken. So this probably isn't a result of climate change directly on this polar bear. It's probably just a very sick polar bear. But the image itself does not 
less in, in any way because of that. It's still an incredibly powerful image. My, my next shot is of um, the Alps in Indonesia, the um, Sumatran range, which I'll be honest, I did not know you had Alps in Indonesia and I did not know you had snow on them because you don't anymore. And it's, it's very interesting to see because there is such a long history of photography, we can use photography as a tool to see the world in the past. And a lot of NASA, ha NASA has a lot of images that go back and look at things like glaciers and things. So we're able to see the ice ranges from 1936 to 2005 and how much that ice has reduced in under 100 years and I'm probably sure has continued to reduce since. The other thing photography can do in the environmental in instance is summarize an entire issue into one thing. So here we have an image from the Black Summer bushfires and I think contextualized with the fact we lost over a million people, a million people, a million people had their houses burn and a billion animals died in those fires. The contrast of a giant fire, an iconic animal, just shows how dire our situation is and nothing can convey that message better than a simple photo. But it's not all doom and gloom. <laughs> so early environmental photography started well back in the 1800s. This is a photo by Carlton Watkins of the Three Brothers. And before he made this, he did lots of other photos in the Yosemite, um, the Yosemite region in America. Hope I'm saying that right. And his photos were actually used to pressure Lincoln into making the Yosemite region the first ever area put aside for public use. It was the first ever land put aside for public use, resort and re recreation. And it's because of his photos that that happened. And then in 1871, Another photographer named William Henry Jackson would use photographs of Yellowstone to have that be turned into the first ever national park in 1872 by Congress. And the grandfather of all landscape photography, Ansel Adams, would also pressure Congress so much so that he made a book of all of his photos and pre presented them to Congress to try and argue that this place needs to be protected. And that is how we got the Sierra, Sierra Nevada and mountain ranges turned into a national park because of his actions which is, you know, the impact of photography has had on our environment a hundred years back has always been a positive one. And then if we go even larger, we get the picture by William Anders called Earthrise, which is taken, as you can see, from the moon. And this photo is, it's renowned as being the most famous environmental photo ever because of what it did. It sparked <laughs> lots of environmental movements. Okay. It sparked lots of environmental movements and um, environmental talks. And it's actually one of the photos they say, because of this photo, we got things like Earth Day and we actually got the original Stockholm meeting because the impact of this photo had was to bring about the fact that, yes, we are on a tiny little planet in the middle of space and we need to protect it, which I think is really cool. So modern environmental photojournalism can kind of be split into two different categories. The first one, which is a lot more similar to what we've seen with Ansel Adams and Watkins, is nature photography, which is more, it's more picturesque and it's more lovely and enjoyable. It's more showing things in habitat and showing nature how it should be. But what we're getting a lot more of now is straight up environmental photography, which doesn't show the picturesque side of nature, it shows what we've done to nature. And I chose these photos, one, because the one at the bottom is the... 2019 winner for environmental photography. The one above is the Kingdom of Buntarga uh, Bang, which I learned about through doing my time with the Chichis. And it doesn't convey, to me at least, it didn't convey how big this place was and how much of an impact we're having on this environment until I saw these photos. There's an entire series he's done, um, Alexander Sattler, on, these, on this place. And the photos he has, for me at least, really contextualize how big of an issue this is much more than even just walking around there virtually dead. I think I can relate a lot more to seeing children in a mountain of garbage than just seeing the mountain of garbage because that is what you're meant to do. You're meant to see the impact that we're having. For myself, I, um, I have been doing some photojournalism. Uh, I would say I mainly started this year and the first instance I had was with a botulism outbreak in a pond. So we had a pond near where I live that had about a hundred seabirds that water birds wash up dead. And it, nothing was being done about it. So I went there with the people who were cleaning it up and I documented all the, all the birds we found. I photographed them, I compelled them and I sent them along to 
Seabird Rescue who were doing it, and they used my photos to pressure the council into doing the right thing. And since then, they've got the pump working, the water's filtering properly, and they haven't had an outbreak of botulism. And that's just the first thing I've done, really. I saw it was an issue, and I went to try and change it. After that, I looked at um, the Western ringtail possum. So these are critically endangered animals. They're adorable. Um, and yeah, they're, criti they're critically endangered, and they live pretty much entirely in the southwest of Western Australia. And they're building a road currently called, through a place called the Gilark Corridor, straight through their habitat, which is a major issue for lots of people. So I followed this story, I got involved, and I went to the protests, and I photographed some protesters and the possums to try and, I don't know, to try and have an impact, to have something I could put out there and say, this isn't okay and this needs to stop. And we went to the protest on the 31st of July, and then on the 1st of the next month, so the 1st of August, yeah, we had... On the 1st of August, we had deforestation beginning straight away. And I went there with lots of other people to try and just document some of the things happening. We had people being arrested for tying themselves to machines. We had trees being thrown into blenders to just be completely destroyed. And it was really harrowing stuff. But the people who were there stood there the entire month photographing and documenting everything they saw to try and make a difference. And that is what I think was really impressive about this, that these people didn't have fancy cameras, they had their cell phones. They were mostly all senior citizens, quite a few young people, mostly senior citizens going out, seeing an issue and photographing, documenting it to try and change it. And I think that's the biggest takeaway I can make for this entire thing is that one of the things I've learned from this as well, if it wasn't photographed, it didn't happen because we took the photograph just before because we have to photograph everything. And I think it's a very true statement. If you see something, you have to photograph it. Otherwise, you do not have proof because end of the day, you have as many words as you want. But if you don't have actual photographic proof of it, 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 it could be denied. So photographic proof is always the most important thing. And for youth living in the, the world of cell phones and cameras, everyone has a camera on them at all times nowadays. So I think it's very important that if you ever see something, you just take a photo because you have a camera. Everyone has a camera on them at all times. And the cameras we have today are significantly better than the cameras they were using 100 years ago. And then with that as well, we also have social media, which is the best way possible to share our photos. Um, as I said, the people who were fighting for the GeoRock Corridor, they put all their photos on, on the internet and their photos have been shared around. They're on the news, everything because they put them out there into the world. And social media, while it can be a bit confronting and does lead to some fake news, it can also be incredibly liberating and has to be used properly. Uh, a good example of how social media could be used is if you think about something like the Napalm Girl, if you guys know that photo of the girl running in Vietnam from a US airdrop of Napalm, that photo was almost not shown on the front of the New York Times because it contained nudity. That is one of the most important photos of the generation that summarizes the entire thing wrong with the Vietnam War. And they almost didn't show it because it wasn't, it wasn't PC at the time. And you cannot have something like that happen these days. We have social media. If we see something, we can put it up there and everyone gets to see it. Censorship, media bias, all of that doesn't work when everyone's informed and everyone's active and trying to share these messages. So yes, that is my little weird ramble about photography and photojournalism. Thank you for listening. I, I hope it was informative and I hope it was interesting. And I hope I had fun pictures. Okay, thank you very much, Greg. That's uh, good. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, very inspiring how the, um, the journalism, the photography could uh, be approved and alarm that there is something that we need to do to save our planet, and also um, and also through photography uh, could portray the musing of our natures to also build awareness on what we have and reminding us to preserve all of those. And as uh, you already uh, mentioned, that uh, we can utilize. Uh, yeah, everything, almost everything nowadays, we have a pond that uh, ready to uh, take the picture. And we can also um, 
spread uh, our uh, photo through the social media. It's uh, going uh, very handy these days. And this could be uh, one of our tools uh, to uh, build awareness for the uh, environment preservations. Thank you for your uh, valuable presentation, Craig. And for the second speakers, we have here um, Claire Wu, student at the Australian National University. Um, currently, uh, Claire studying science and environment and sustainability, majoring in evolution ecology and organismal biology, conservation and sustainability studies. Since it was college, uh, Claire has actively engaged in many activities on building awareness related to environmental issues, such as fast fashions, rip conservations, recycling, and so on. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, without further ado, well, let's welcome our second speakers. Hi, Claire, how are you? Hi, thanks for the welcome and thank you for the opportunity. Um, okay, please, uh, the screen is yours. You may proceed your uh, presentation. Yeah. So today I'm going to be talking about the role of youth in delivering science for environmental action. So by 2050, our planet's population is expected to increase from 7.7 .7 billion to 9.6 billion. So if we were co to continue with our current way of living with the same unsustainable patterns of consumption and production, we would need almost three planets worth of resources. Um, this is because our world is consuming resources faster than they can be replaced. And we are over um, extracting and not closing the loop by recycling. So there's a lot of pollution and waste. Um, this is degrading our ecosystems, um, habitats and species that we ultim ultimately depend on for so many of the earth's processes. We also have climate change to deal with, deforestation among other issues. Um, so the UN has predicted that a lot of this growth will be coming from the Asia Pacific region um, and considerably from Indonesia as it's amongst the fastest growing economies right now. So this means that the youth of Indonesia today will be raising, setting an, an example for and hopefully governing our future generations. So the values and standards of the youth today will guide the actions taken tomorrow and the direction that our planet takes in the future. So as the youth um, constitutes the majority of the population in many countries, um, and the youth also have an increasingly strong social and environmental awareness, they truly have the power to transform our societies towards a low carbon and climate resilient future. So youth is generally defined as the age group of people between 15 to 24 years, but it can vary. Um, and today there are 1.8 billion young people according, uh, accounting for 23% of our global population. Um, Indonesia alone has 65 million young people, which comprises 28% of the population. So this is the largest generation of youth in, in all of history so far and one unlike any other. So the youth of today have witnessed the first climate impacts and throughout their lives, they will likely experience the worst that has yet to come. So younger people are growing up with the effects of global warming that are visible all around them. So from heat waves to flooding, drought, sea level rise, the world's biggest mass extinction and the melting ice sheets, so this generation was born into this crisis and as a result are largely aware and acknowledge that climate change is a real issue. And because they will have to live through and deal with all of these problems, they're more likely to take it seriously, um, to learn about it and to do something about it. And we all have our personal um, anxiety about climate change in the future. But unlike older generations that think it's well beyond saving, it's someone else's problem, the youth can use their concern to motivate action 
and rather see climate change as an opportunity to create a different and more regenerative world. Um, I don't know about you, but Gen Z, I, I've noticed, are especially angry that not enough is being done to address climate change amongst many other issues and are optimistic that we can reduce its effects. Um, this generation wants to see changes in the system that no longer serves us and wreaks absolute havoc on the living world. So we can see all around us, deforestation is increasing, pollution is increasing, um, and these negatives are not um, even directly benefit, benefiting us. We see that inequality is increasing. It's become more and more difficult and costly to live. And we're beginning to question who is benefiting from this system. So the 1% of the world um, and these mega companies are unequally consuming and destroying our planet. And we're coming, but we're becoming aware that the way, the way we do things are not sustainable and need to be changed. So who's gonna change the world? <laughs> So the youth is still far away from entering government um, or changing policy or changing the economic and political systems of the world. We can't um, directly value the environmental services and damages um, in our economies. But instead, um, the youth can um, work towards environmental action through a bottom-up approach. And this is when a large number of people um, work together to push for change. And they cause a decision to arise um, higher up, such as in government or even within companies in the private sector. So harnessing the power of social influence is one of the most effective ways to elicit pro-environmental behaviors um, in consumption and production and things like that. Um, and this is because it allows us to change the beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors of others. And these are more likely to stand the test of time and be intergenerational. So even when we think we don't have much political power, um, you can use your money, your time, your attention to make a change. For example, when we um, boycott certain companies because we don't support their practices, it sends a wider message and it sets a standard for other businesses to clean up their act. Similarly, things like voting or which celebrities you support really add up and can totally change um, the direction of society. I don't wanna get too um, philosophical, but at the end of the day, everything is a human construct. The way we have set out this world, the way we structure it, it was made by us, so it can be changed by us as well. And so young people are the key actors in raising awareness. You know, we are the most social age group. Gen Z is the, is the smartest and best educated generation. We're able to use the unlimited wealth of knowledge available on the internet and are just as easily able to spread it around. Um, the youth is more accepting and willing to change our lifestyle, um, to try new things, to um, innovate, to adopt environmentally friendly practices such as recycling, um, supporting renewable energy, using public transport, um, reduce, reuse, recycle, um, planting trees, and we generally have an interest in conservation. And on the small scale, these things might seem um, insignificant, but when you have a lot of people doing these things, it can create a positive feedback loop, and we can um, get real changes within our family, our local communities, and then that will go all the way up to government and companies. And one way the youth delivers science and calls for action is from social media, like Craig mentioned. Um, social media serves as a mobilizing tool. So it's a platform to organize rallies and protests and other local projects. Um, and it serves as well as expressive spaces to share knowledge and inform people about 
sustainable practices or other issues. Um, so yeah, social media also gives the youth a powerful voice and allows for the message of like hope and um, other issues to be spread um, in an in a easily digestible way. So I don't know how many of you use TikTok. I'm personally addicted. <laughs> Um, and this might just be my curated feed, but I'm constantly seeing young people like exposing celebrities for their overconsumption and holding decision makers accountable, such as um, destruction in the Amazon rainforest um, and communicating global issues that we just wouldn't hear about otherwise. Um, yeah, so it's clear that the older generations have largely failed to integrate environmental science into action. And young people refuse to sit by and be the victims of climate change. Um, the youth must take a leading role in influencing, advocating, and demanding for responsible climate behavior and stronger political will from governments and the private sector. Thanks everybody for listening. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Claire. It is a very um, knowledgeable, especially in part you mentioned about the population of young generation in Indonesia. It's quite surprising that uh, we, Indonesian, has 28% from the populations. It's a huge mm. number. And we could uh, utilize uh, this, um, maybe uh, if you... If you, if we refer to the uh, key, keynote speech by Mr. Sarwono that mentioned demographic uh, dividends, uh, it is a quiet opportunity for Indonesia uh, to actively participate in uh, the environments. And uh, as you are a young generation, um, you elaborately a very com elaborate a very comprehensive approach uh, for the young generations with the bottom-up approaches and utilizations of the social media. I believe that most of us here are quite uh, familiar with TikTok and Instagram, and we can utilize this platform uh, to spreading the um, environmental awareness uh, to our young generations. Again, thank you very much, Claire, for your uh, knowledgeable presentations. Let's move forward to our third speakers. So uh, for the third speakers, <clears throat> we have Stevie Leonard Harrison. Uh, Stevie is a passionate youth activist from Indonesia. He is the founder of Inspirator Muda Nusantara, a national youth empowerment community focusing on SDGs. He obtained his bachelor's from the Department of International Relations, the University of Indonesia in 2010, and currently studying for a master's in the School of Environmental Science at the same campus. Today, Stevie will share his thoughts on enhancing the capacity of youth for sustainable future. Okay, Stevie? Yes. Are you there? Okay. Yes, thank you. Are you ready to share your thoughts today with us? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, uh, great. Thank so, uh, ladies uh, and gentlemen, please welcome Stevie Leonard Harrison. Stevie, the screen is yours. Thank you for the opportunity, Ms. Maria, as moderator of this event. Uh, I would like to thank you to organizers, Environment Institute, Iluni Silui, APIC Network, and ACCIS for uh, organizing this event today. Uh, I would like to present my thoughts on environmental science. Sorry. Environmental, environmental science for enhancing capacity of youth for sustainable future. I'm a master's student at School of Environmental Science and Dr. Mahawan is my lecturer. Thank you, Dr. Mahawan, for the opportunity given to me. So, the in the first slide, I would like to highlight about the, uh, the program that 
concerning about the environmental science, there are four universities here from uh, my campus, uh, Sekolah Ilmu Lingkungan Universitas Indonesia, and then Harvard University, and then uh, Craig Campus, Murdoch University, and then Clare Campus, Australian National University. So based on this uh, explanation from the four universities program on environmental science, I will try to uh, highlight about one keyword that we have to uh, understand about the, what is environmental science. So what uh, what the keyword uh, uh, you can you can also actively engage through a chat box if you can find some or one keywords that uh, uh, precisely describe about the what is environmental science for uh, uh, building capacity for youth. You can start. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen for actively participate in chat box. What the keyword for environmental, uh, environmental science? You can see in the description of uh, the four universities program on environmental science, there are one keywords that uh, being built for the uh, solution of environmental science. Yeah, there are some participants already write their thoughts on the chat box thank you yeah the the first uh, the first keywords that i will try to highlight is environmental challenge or environmental problems so the environmental science is the solution for environmental challenges or environmental problems that we are facing right now at the present because there are a uh, series from a uh, series of time from 1972 when Stockholm already uh, when Stockholm declaration already published in the 1972 and then move up to the uh, this year 2022 so it's already uh, passing 50 years for the journey of the Stockholm uh, declaration to uh, uh, this year at uh, uh, UNEP uh, at 50 uh, anniversary. So if we can see the keywords for environmental science is environmental challenges and uh, problems. So the question is, are we part of solutions? Are we agent of transformations? And are we heroes for the planet? So we can ask ourselves for these three a uh, sub question for us to asking ourselves are we part of solution are we agent of transformations and are we heroes for the planet so based on these three question i would like to uh, describe uh, about the the characters of environmental science so the first one is multidisciplinary if we look at the uh, rainbow diagram uh, for environmental science, <clears throat> there are many disciplines here integrated into the environmental science, from ranging from engineering, economics, ethics, ecology, biology, chemistry, atmospheric science, oceanography, geology, archaeology, anthropology, sociology, history, and political science. My backgrounds, my background, my academic background uh, before my bachelor degree was on international uh, relations. So why I do, uh, I do choose cross-disciplinary uh, uh, study? Why I move from international relations to environmental science? Because I want to uh, develop my uh, uh, concern on environmental diplomacy. That's why I have to, uh, I have decided to, to move from international relations to environmental science. So the character of environmental science right, uh, right here are uh, uh, classified as three. So the first one is multidisciplinary where people from dis uh, different disciplines working together, each drawing on their disciplinary knowledge. And the second one is interdisciplinary where uh, the people integrating knowledge and methods from different disciplines using a real synthesis of approach. 
And the third one is transdisciplinary, which is creating unity of intellectual frameworks beyond the disciplinary perspective. So environmental studies open up opportunities to explore both human and natural system and to bring the two spheres together. It is based on artreminder.com 2022. And uh, the principles of environmental science, there are four. There are four uh, main princi uh, principles source uh, from our uh, guidance books, <clears throat> guidance book in our School of Environmental Science, Universitas Indonesia, there are four. The first one is economically profitable and then environmentally sustainable uh, and then uh, socially acceptable. And the fourth one is techno technologically manageable. So the four principles of uh, environmental science here are to bring uh, solutions and uh, benefits to the society and the nature at uh, and the nature itself because uh, environmental science are uh, are uh, already in the place for the, uh, saving the planet for the future uh, generations to come and i would like to uh, emphasize that there are 13 biggest environmental problems of 2022 here based on earth.org. Uh, this is global warming from fossil fuels. Sorry. and then uh, poor governance, and then food waste, uh, and then biodiversity loss, and then uh, plastic pollution, deforestation, air pollution, melting ice caps and sea level rise, and then ocean acidification, agriculture and food system, food and water insecurity, fast fashion and textile, uh, textile, textile waste, and then the last one is overfishing. So the 13 biggest environmental problems here uh, is already happening in many places around the world, around the world, including in Australia and uh, Indonesia, because uh, where we talk about the Indonesia and Australia, there are uh, plastic uh, pollution and then uh, also uh, global warming from fossil fuels and biodiversity loss. Uh, this is the this is the biggest environment problems that are we are facing uh, uh, today. So the circumstances that I would like to uh, point it out here, uh, this is like Claire already described before, uh, based on World Youth, Re uh, World Youth Report, uh, published by U United Nations uh, Department of Economic and Social Affairs in 2022. This is the projected population of youth aged, uh, aged uh, 15 to 24 years in 2022, 2023, and 2050. So there are uh, slightly uh, in Asia, in Asia Pacific, in Eastern and Southern Asia and Australia and New Zealand, there are slight uh, uh, increasing for the youth population in 2010, uh, uh, 2030. And for the 2050, there are uh, some uh, slightly decreasing for the Eastern and Southern Asia, uh, including in Indonesia. And for the Australia and New Zealand, there are slight uh, increasing for the 2050. So it, if we can count for uh, three, 30, uh, 30 years changes uh, for the youth population here, We can see that there are more than uh, 100 million uh, youth population additional uh, added added to the global population in only uh, uh, 30 years from 2020. 
2020 to 2000. The, the, the circumstances that we have basically uh, uh, look at the Global Environmental Outlook 6 for a youth report uh, published by United Nations Environment Program. Uh, in the our region, Asia and the Pacific, uh, the blue one, the blue region one, if we can see the global map here, the F1, the F1, uh, we can see that the SDGs for uh, uh, like the environment pillar here, goal 13, goal 14, goal 15, we can see that in the Asia and the Pacific, we have to increase our awareness because uh, it is not uh, it is not quite a priority for for youth because when we can see the title of the figure this uh, sustainable development goals prioritize for the future we can see that uh, uh, in in asia and the pacific the awareness is still low so there are uh, some uh, pessimism pessimism about the uh, goal goals that related to environment environmental pillar here compared to uh, North America, Europe, and even Africa, because Africa has a uh, has a very, uh, very huge level of awareness uh, of climate crisis and environmental problems there. So the potential after we discuss about the circumstances, we have to discuss also the potential as we uh, have to uh, we have to adopt more comprehensive approach here. The, pot the potentials that I would like to highlight is green jobs for youth pack. Uh, it is the uh, collaboration between the International Labour Organization and, and United Nations Children uh, Fund UNICEF and United Nations Environment Program here because this one is uh, the result of the side event of Stockholm Plus Fifty. Uh, the green Green jobs for youth pack uh, uh, consisting about uh, consisting of three three, uh, com three main components, uh, and then the second one is green skills part of the integration between the communities and network. So it is the coalition green coalition. So the Green Jobs for Youth Pack is a, a declaration by the UN agencies to accelerate the young skills and talent for green jobs. Uh, so it will be uh, it will be a formal uh, a formal uh, um, formal uh, like uh, the result of the uh, UN documents for uh, to be adopted by the national government to to be implemented in the national scales including in indonesia and australia uh, it is uh, the the new one in 2022 by united nation environment program so uh, i i think it will be uh, next year will be the will be socialized to uh, national government agencies. And yeah, so there are three pillars of the green jobs uh, for you back here. The first one is employment. Employment is supporting design job creation and the greening of the economy and create a new inclusive, sustainable and resilient recovery with young people's interests, dreams and future at its heart. And uh, the second one is environment and is knowledge and training institution to ensure that young people are given the opportunity to acquire the needed green skills to make the transition to a low carbon, circular, and nature positive economy. Here with young people to design and implement youth led initiative that reach the most marginalized individuals and ensure they are they are in green entrepreneurship. So uh, move up to the, sorry. Yeah. So this is uh, what I would like to, uh, I would like to point it out uh, heavily because if we, if we look,
Uh, hello? Steffi, are you there? Okay, everyone, I think uh, our speakers, our third speakers currently facing a signal problem. So um, uh, please wait a second. We are waiting uh, Steffi to come back. Hello? So um, we are waiting uh, Steffi to continue to complete uh, his presentation. In the meantime, uh, if you have any questions, you may uh, raise your question in the chat box. You may, you may also proceed your questions in Bahasa Indonesia, the committee, and I will uh, gladly to uh, help you interpret, interpret your question to our speakers. So we have uh, four speakers. Uh, the first speakers is Craig Duncan uh, talking about uh, how the photography art and journalism could be utilized to uh, building awareness on the environmental preservations. And uh, Claire Wu also um, uh, from the youth uh, perspective. Um, Okay, noted uh, committee. Uh, Claire Wu from uh, the youth perspective, how could you utilize the uh, social media nowadays to also building awareness on the environment uh, preservations? So I think um, we couldn't, um, yeah, we couldn't uh, waiting for this first. Uh, TV, but I think uh, if you have any question for the presentation material uh, presented by uh, Stevie Harrison, you may also proceed your question in the chat box. Uh, Maria, okay, okay. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, without further ado, let's welcome our fourth speakers. Um, we have uh, Fajar Munik Putranto, an associate an environmental specialist at Environment Institute. Currently, he is also working as Vice CEO at PT Cipta Sinar, VC Sinar Kencana, sorry, um, or KencanaOnline.com, and previously worked as a banker at CIMB Niaga. He graduated from Agro-Industrial Technology at IPB University in 2013 and received engineer certification from engineers professions program at IPB graduate schools. Okay, Fajar, are you there? Yes, I'm always okay. here. Are you ready for your presentation today? Yes. Absolutely. Okay, great. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome uh, Fajar Munik Pratanto. Uh, Mas Fajar, please, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you, um, Mbak Maria. Uh, can you see my screen? Great. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank okay. you. So, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, all the distinguished uh, participants in this webinar, the Honorable Bapak Sarwono, uh, Bapak Mahawan, and all the speakers. Um, I would like to uh, present uh, my uh, presentation. Uh, is entitled "The Empowering Youth Through Climate Education for a Sustainable Living." So uh, maybe all, all of you have, have heard about the photojournalism, about the empowerment of youth, and also how about the environmental science uh, could go further action in uh, combating climate change. Now here, I'm just completing <laughs> all the puzzles from the uh, previous uh, three speakers. Uh, I would love to talk about the education. But uh, before I uh, want to deliver my presentation, uh, please allow me to tell you a bit about Environment Institute. Uh, I'm on behalf of Environment Institute uh, as the organizer of this event. I would like to share a bit uh, about our uh, action in this previous um, uh, events. So uh, Environment Institute is uh, actually an organization that uh, engaging in research and also environmental action. And we have um, delivers uh, a lot of uh, webinar, uh, as you can see in the uh, international uh, and also the national webinar. And uh, the last that uh, our CEO has made for Environment Institute is our podcast on YouTube. 
So uh, we want to deliver everything about environmental issues, both in uh, nationwide or globally, in a very interesting way, in a very light and could be received by uh, all the audience. So uh, hopefully uh, you can uh, visit our uh, YouTube podcast at Environment Institute. And also you can also follow our Instagram at Enviro underscore ID and also our Twitter and Viro underscore ID. And now let's go to our <laughs> to my presentation. I want to start my presentation by uh, looking at qu uh, quotes from uh, Herbert Spencer as a philosopher. And he said that the great aim of education is not knowledge, but actually the action. So hopefully by having this webinar is not only to in increase our knowledge, uh, but also to trigger what is the next action that we could do after uh, following this webinar. So this is the situation uh, in the global youth. Uh, I surveyed uh, in some of the reports that nearly a fifth of the youth surveyed said they feel powerless to do something about climate change. So the, the uh, background about uh, they feel powerless is the first one is the absence of support by community and government, and also uh, lack of adequate funding and time for field uh, visits and disinterest among students and lack of teacher trainings. But maybe uh, this uh, young is uh, surveyed uh, for the youth that already know about the climate situation. Maybe there are a lot of uh, youth, uh, maybe in Indonesia or Australia or all over the world that still don't know the issue of the uh, climate change. So I think this is a very um, uh, serious condition that we have to put attention that maybe there are a lot of youth that still are untouched with the climate issues and the youth that already touch with the climate issues, they feel powerless. They could not do to do anything. And this is the example of the uh, youth from Australia uh, said that are not thought as if it's a real thing affecting us currently and requires immediate action, but they are thought as a problem for future generations. And also youth from Indonesia uh, also said, there's no attempt on making it important. The curriculum doesn't require the students to take action. I received more information by following NGOs online, by website or social media accounts. So it's a complete thing like Claire has said in the previous uh, presentation that social media has a big role uh, in these climate issues right now. But uh, in the other hand, uh, the climate education, uh, maybe uh, in many schools uh, in Indonesia or maybe in Australia, doesn't teach uh, straightforward about how to combating uh, the climate change and how to uh, make the sustainability of our environment. So this is um, uh, become our issue. This is the situation that um, uh, that we are uh, facing uh, in Indonesia. I, I just took uh, an example of the plastic consumption in Indonesia that always be increasing. And 79% of the plastic is end up in landfill, river, and Astra. So this is very ironic uh, and very serious. Uh, so the population is kept uh, increasing, the youth uh, also kept increasing, but I don't think that the education of the, uh, about environment and also uh, climate is um, sufficient to cover all of this issue. And also not only in Indonesia, but in Australia it's also happened the same thing. There are a lot of um, uh, waste or uh, garbage in Australia that also will be increasing along with the, the rising population there. And I think these two countries also represent the situation globally. And this is the situation that in Indonesia, uh, only in Indonesia, I took uh, data. And this is quite surprising that until now, most of the waste are uh, processing is only being burned or maybe just put it in a hole or just put it in the landfill without any further process. And only 50% is, is put on rubbish bin and the rest are is still going to river, ocean, or the drainage uh, along the road and others. So this is very um, serious since uh, we have uh, established uh, education curriculum uh, since uh, long decades ago, but the uh, behavior of our population still put uh, burning waste 
as the first priority to process their waste. So uh, I think uh, this data uh, has a lot of message for us that education is a primary thing uh, about uh, uh, our action in combating and climate change. And also our uh, Minister of Education, uh, Nadi Makarim, uh, said that um, the current education system still focus on memorizing methods and is not uh, succeeding in building the awareness of students and parents that environmental education is our way to save uh, the next generation. But uh, Nadim also said uh, in, in the future, uh, who wants to transform the education system by including the environmental action in the learning process. But the very important thing is not only uh, including the edu uh, education, but also to trigger the students to do the action, uh, to, which is relevant to the real world needs including the need for climate change education. So this is just a, a wrap up uh, of our uh, current situation. And maybe uh, I put some recommendation from paper and also from myself. Uh, the first one is the climate inf uh, information provided in schools must be reliable and based on the base available and reputable source science. So a lot of students, a lot of youth now are engaged uh, with all uh, the social media and there are a lot of, maybe there are a lot of fake news and hoax uh, that are spreading all of in the uh, social media accounts. So the, uh, the reliable source must be provided uh, to give, uh, to bring the awareness uh, all, of all over the youth and the world. And also, we need to connect the schools with universities, uh, researchers and industry. And this is the triple helix concept. So the students have uh, uh, the opportunity uh, in the exchange of the skill and knowledge and uh, based on the real action in the industry. And also it's important to equip uh, the teachers uh, with the skill and also the knowledge and climate information and data because they are the key person, the key people that will uh, teach uh, the students about the environmental issues. And uh, this one has already become the program of Indonesian uh, government to provide data center uh, through different platforms and accessible for you. So hopefully it could be uh, released uh, soon. So uh, I think this data center is very important to uh, combating the hoax that may be uh, spreading in all of the uh, social media right now. So when the government has the reliable and the valid data, uh, it will encounter one of the problem in the environmental issue. And uh, there are a lot of, uh, right now there are also competition, investor pitching uh, for students to join the, uh, the international international conferences. So uh, this is a very good opportunity uh, if you guys are still in school to join this uh, competition to explore about the science and also to uh, trigger your idea how to solve uh, the environmental issues. And so support the development of climate change activism, uh, project-based learning and organization through extracurricular activities. So I think this is the thing that I haven't received since I was in elementary until the high school. I spent 12 years of uh, having school uh, back then before going to college, but uh, never in my life I've got a single lesson about how to manage waste, how to what is about carbon emission, or what is the uh, anything related to environment, uh, environmental, both locally and globally. So I think this extracurricular activities is is very interesting uh, for students uh, right now to equip uh, the knowledge about the environmental issue. And the last thing is uh, encouraging financial, financial support through investor and for a competitive proposal and the climate action. So before I close my presentation, I would like to give an example of the action that maybe is currently happening in Indonesia. So I am quoting from the Ministry of uh, Environment and Forestry, uh, Republic of Indonesia. Uh, uh, they talk about the climate change internalization in education curriculum. So there are two methods uh, in internalizing, uh, internalizing the uh, curriculum education. The first one is the monolithic by incorporating informational education materials into one of the school's local content. Maybe for Indonesian uh, uh, fellows uh, can uh, relate to muatan lokal or mulok. 
my muatan local or my local content is only uh, like the uh, the language uh, the tribe language in our area but this is actually interesting to uh, brings the mulak muatan local the local content about like this in indramayu there is a, a, a lesson about the mangrove thematic environmental there are a lot of mangrove in indramayu maybe it will be different in aceh until uh, papua there are a lot of uh, local content about environment can be equipped in the school lesson so uh, students are more interesting and have a wide knowledge about environmental issue in their uh, local area and the uh, second one is the integration with the integration of environmental environmental education materials into all subjects so like the mathematics we could uh, maybe the simple ones uh, to put some specific terms about environmental or, or about carbon emission or maybe when we talk about physics when we we'll talk about chemistry uh, we could give it an example about uh, uh, what is happening uh, the the popular terms that's happening right now about the environment and about the climate change okay i think uh, that's all uh, my presentation hopefully uh, you guys can uh, enjoy <laughs> Thank you. Over to you, Ma Maria. Okay, thank you very much, Fajar, for your uh, valuable uh, presentations. So Fajar uh, presented about how the integration in education um, uh, could be a strategy, powerful strategy, yeah, to in, uh, for building uh, environmental awareness, uh, integrated strategy between education content, school school and university as embodied institutions and also human resources capacity building including uh, teachers uh, in the field of education thank you very much fajar uh, before we move forward to the q and a sessions uh, we will have uh, photo sessions so i will uh, i will give the opportunity to uh Mbak Anita. So everyone, please uh, turn on your camera. We will take a picture together. Okay. So ready, Mbak Anita, for taking picture. Stop, satu, ya. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Banita, for uh, the time. And before we move forward to Q Q and A session, uh, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Sarwono Kusumat Maja to give a feedback for uh, our speakers. Um, we have four speakers here, um, already presented about uh, how young generations, uh, they are representing the young generation to be involved, uh, actively participate in the environmental uh, preservations. Pak Sarwono, do you have any I'm feedback? <laughs> Very impressed yeah, with the uh, quality and wide range of knowledge that uh, our speakers have shown. Uh, there's certainly more, much, much more climate uh, literate yeah, uh, compared to uh, my generation, for instance, when we were at their age. Yeah. So it, this uh, uh, advantage yeah, in absorbing climate knowledge and commitment. Hopefully, uh, the things that can be done by them in the future would also be different from what we are seeing now with uh, this generation. Uh, why is climate change uh, accelerating, to give an example? Uh, because uh, in the international negotiations, too much time is devoted to debates and discussions. And whenever there is a, an opportunity for action, that opportunity has not been 
well utilized. We call it in Indonesian omdo. Yeah. Now, uh, with the speakers that uh, I've listened to today, I'm very confident that a more action-oriented generation would, you know, uh, rise to the surface in the future, and so uh, they can be the enabling stakeholders of sustainability of the future. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Pak Sarwono, uh, for your feedback. And of course, um, we as a young generation also will uh, will be very um, will need uh, your uh, guidance on uh, what uh, we have uh, to uh, improve. Uh, utilizing, of course, our uh, as a young generation, we are uh, very. Um, could take advantage from the technology, uh, advanced technology nowadays. However, still, uh, there are a certain ways that we need to learn from uh, your generations, of course. But. Okay, um, for the Q&A sessions, um, we already have uh, some questions here for our speakers. We will start from uh, wait a second. We have here a question from Craig. Hello, Craig. Are you there? Uh, you're still uh, on mute, Craig. Yeah. I did I okay. Finish? Yeah. Uh, we we received oh, questions for for you. Oh, okay, uh, sorry, okay. sorry, it's a from. Yeah, go. Cool. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. The first question is: uh, What are the challenge for you to use photography as a tool for environmental advocacy? Mm. Quite interesting <laughs> question. <laughs> so please go ahead, Craig, for the I'd first say, questions. I'd say one of the biggest problems I have. Um, oh, there's there's a range of problems. I think. The first problem I always have is when I was doing the cleanup with the botulas and birds, I was heavily involved with that. So I actually didn't record as much as I should have. I was mainly picking up dead birds. So it's finding the balance between documenting and actually doing, which is really difficult. The other thing is knowing what limit you're allowed to push, because here in Australia, we have massive and very vast roads and they get full of roadkill. And every time you see a native dead on the road, it's a really, you know, it's an animal that's probably endangered dead on the side of the road. And I have been photographing them, but I haven't shared them because I do not know if I'm pushing too many boundaries by showing off dead animals to people. I was very iffy about showing skeletons in this presentation because I have a lot worse on my hard drive. And it's, it's finding the balance between what is acceptable and what is necessary. And I think eventually you'll push the thing to realize that everything is necessary. But for me, I'm not at that point yet where I'm still, I don't want to do this and get shouted at by someone. Okay, thank you very much, Craig. So ladies and gentlemen, there is a highlight here. Uh, the answer from Craig, uh, we need to know the, uh, between bond, uh, we need to know the boundaries between what is necessary and what is, uh, Acceptable, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Craig. And the second question I have here, question from Claire. Hello, Claire. Hi. Are you ready for the yeah. questions? <laughs> okay, we have a question here uh, for you. What are key of success for strengthening um, collaboration with and among youth? So do you have any uh, idea or suggestion on the collaboration among youth? Yeah, so definitely, as I mentioned, um, social media is definitely the biggest platform for collaboration because you can collaborate um, between countries like um, through um, language barriers um, and like Facebook, you can organize local events, things like that. Um, and also, as um, Fajr mentioned, um, 
you can use that as education to educate each other. Um, if like you might um, learn something new and you can use social media to teach other people. Okay, again, uh, the utilization of social media could across uh, bon uh, boundaries yeah, between countries, language barriers, and so on. So, uh, but we have another question here, Claire. <laughs> Are you mm -hmm. okay with that? Okay, yeah. for, the, for the second question. Um, it is more, um, what, yeah, opinion, yeah. Uh, there is a participant here asking your opinion. What can a Gen Z do to bring awareness not only for Gen Z itself, but also for older generations? So it's across the generations. What, mm -hmm. what, what, what the young generation can do? Yeah, so I think when we um, Gen Z fights for something, they're not just doing it just for them because the planet is shared by everyone. So, <clears throat> and like climate change is um, approaching us so quickly and um, these issues um, will affect those of any age. Um, but I think Gen Z feels more, um, how would I say, responsible because um, we're getting to that age where um, you know, people want to start families, they want to get into careers, um, and the future doesn't look bright. So I think they, they really want to make a change. And yeah, it's just not for them, for everyone. Yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you very much, uh, Claire. Um, okay, before we move forward to another question, Right in. <clears throat> oh, wait a second. Okay, I apologize for that. Um, we will move forward for the next question for Stevie. Stevie, are you there? Okay, so sorry yeah. for uh, the internet trouble. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Experience. Sorry for internet. <laughs> yeah, connection is very unstable here. Sorry. Okay, <clears throat> we have question here for uh, you. Mm -hmm. What is the easiest way to access and engage youth? What the easiest way? Yeah, to access. Okay. Okay. Thank you for the questions delivered to me. Uh, yeah, for for uh, like to become a, a young environmental science uh, scientist here, uh, we have to uh, uh, to know our patient. The first one is, what is our patient? Deep patient. So it's like uh, you have to know yourself. You have to uh, understand yourself uh, deeper, because if we if we know ourselves, what uh, what's the future journey, uh, what the future career, what the future education, what uh, uh, the future uh, challenges that we we want to. Uh, address or solve so we, we will uh, we will get the easiest ways like me I want to become uh, an environmental diplomat so what uh, I need to do is like I move from my bachelor degree on international relations to uh, study master in uh, environmental science so by these ways uh, like uh, you have to to communicate even with yourself because uh, when you communicate with yourself you have to know the motivation you have to know the um, 
uh, what's your what's your deep uh, what's your deep uh, insights on yourself what on how you can uh, uh, how you can enjoy uh, your life uh, quote like um, uh, you can be a young environmental uh, activist you can be a young environmental uh, enthusiast by become uh, like me uh, in the previous year i i was uh, beca- became the uh, climate ambassador in indonesia for a global youth climate network a world bank group uh, so i joined uh, virtually from indonesia and connect with washington dc uh, headquarters for the world bank i connect with many uh, climate ambassadors from uh, more than 130 countries so we can learn together we can uh, propose uh, some initiatives together environmental on environmental issues uh, and then we can also communicate with uh, many uh, potential leaders from around the world especially on uh, solving environmental and climate issues so i think the easiest ways is to uh, reflect on yourself first and then connect with others and then uh, the final one is to uh, is to make your ways, uh, make your own journey uh, easier by uh, knowing your steps on how on how you can develop yourself. So that's from me. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, TV. So maybe um, beside reflecting uh, ourselves, but also providing a platform that a young generation could share among uh, us uh, in, in regard to the environmental issues. Uh, that's the thing. And for the uh, next question is, uh, we will go back again to Craig. Yep. Okay, Craig, um, we have a question here for you. Based on your experience, what is the most shocking photos that you have taken regarding to climate change? Ooh, regarding climate change. Um, regarding climate change, I'd say the most shocking photos I have would be probably the botulism birds the um the dead animals when it came to that pond because that outbreak started because we had a r- incredibly big heat wave and the pump that was powering that pond just died and they didn't fix it in time so we had a massive outbreak of botulism in that pond that killed well over a hundred birds all completely dead and skeletal so i'd say regarding climate change that is by far the most shocking photo i have I think the most shocking photos I do have would be most of the roadkill because I have some, um, like I have a photo of the Western ring opossum, which we knew were critically endangered and we have that road being built. And then I have a photo of one completely dead, completely mangled on the side of the road. And it's really confronting, especially when you know how unfortunate the situation is with them to then just see them dead on the side of the road while you're trying to protest them building a road. So most of my photos would be unfortunately dead animals because whenever I see an alive animal, I'm usually trying to help it, which is my other issue. I, I always, I'll, I'll help an animal and then realize, ah, oh, that'd have been a great photo, but it's too late now, I've already helped it, so it's fine. So it's mainly just a lot of dead animals, which is fun. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Craig. Another question. Uh, you saw uh, us a very breathtaking picture. Uh, so can you can can you uh, give tips and tricks to us how to make a stunning photos, especially to deliver message through picture? Yeah. That is an amazing question. And I ask myself that every single day because I've been studying photography for th- well over three years. I've been doing it probably since I was like 12 years old 
and I still think that my photos are not good enough. Um, most of the photos I got at the protest when people were tying themselves to machines down in Europe, there, there are other photos which are just so much more phenomenal than mine. And it, it can be degrading, but you've got to realise that everything matters, even a photo on the smartphone. If it shows something important, it will be shared. So obviously you have your rule of thirds and your composition and everything, but genuinely just take photos and eventually you'll get better. It's, it's really cool to see because I can go back and look at photos from five years ago and see how much I've improved, which I still think has massive room for improvement, but it's always going to keep getting better. And yeah, just take photos, remember your basic rules of photography and you will improve. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, so uh, to answer the questions, also we have here a question from uh, one of our participants. What the collaboration that we can do uh, towards the environmental preservations? And as we already uh, hear from the speakers that there's so much we can do, uh, including the collaboration through uh, education, also utilizing the social media, utilizing the photography and journalism, and also uh, providing the international platform, maybe from uh, Stevie, uh, experience how the international platform could accommodate young generation to share the knowledge uh, and also idea and opinion to uh, for the environmental preservations. These things, ladies and gentlemen, uh, although there are so many things that still we want to dig into related to the role of the young generations in sustainable living for sustainable uh, future. However, unfortunately due to time constraints, due to time constraints, we have to finish the discussions for today. Uh, but maybe before we closing uh, the sessions, uh, is there anything um, you would like to tell again from the speakers about uh, what we can do for uh, more collaboration among the young generations? for the environmental uh, preservation. Maybe this is the last, uh, the last uh, statement from uh, all the speakers here. Maybe we can start from uh, Claire. Yeah, so I would say just um, see what's out there, see what's in your community, any groups or um, organizations and try and, um, Use the information out there to educate yourself and um, try and influence um, others through your actions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Claire. And uh, Stevie? Okay, thank you. Uh, from me, I would like to say uh, stay progressive. Uh, be competitive and be collaborative at the same time because we we have to be uh, we have to be a great generations ever in this century uh, because we have to save our planet. There is no planet B. Thank you. Okay, nice. Uh, Fajar. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Maria. So I think my closing statement about collaboration uh, is, uh, like I've said before about the Penta uh, triple helix about the industry and also the government and also uh, education or schools to have a very strong collaboration. And I think it can start from the small things, um, just like uh, the thing that I'm engaging about the waste management, because we still don't see in Indonesia, there's a progress about very simple things, sorting waste. I think sorting waste is a very basic principle, things that could be teach, could be taught in every schools and could be applied in every home to make a, uh, make a very, uh, what do you call it, uh, the very uh, adequate, adequate to, uh, for waste management. Since, uh, so when the waste is sorted, it could be processed at anything. But in Indonesia, the waste is still being dumped anywhere or landfill or maybe in just a drain. So I think that could be a very simple thing, collaboration that we could do uh, at every home. It could be taught in the schools and also it will ease industry 
to make the good technology to process the waste. Thank you, Mbak Maria. Okay, thank you, Fajar, for uh, the last closing statement. Uh, Craig? I think I'd say similar to Claire. It's about utilizing what you have in social media and reaching out. I would say almost every single one of the stories I've tried to cover through my time at university, I've done because something has interested me. We've reached out to a group or a, peop or a person and it's evolved into something much more and something much more interesting. So I think reach out to people and always pay attention to something. If you see something worth talking about, make sure you document it and try talking about it. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Greg. And <clears throat> this is ladies and gentlemen, on behalf, <clears throat> on, pardon. This thing is ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of the organizer, I would like to thank to all uh, the speakers and also Pa Sarwono Kusuma Maja. Thank you very much, Pa, for your time. Uh, Ma Maria, maybe Pa Sarwono if has a closing statement. Oh, yeah, statement okay. Pa um, <laughs> pa, <laughs> if you have anything, yeah, for closing statement. Well, I'd like to uh, let you know, all of you, that uh, I've enjoyed the uh, opinions expressed in this webinar. It's uh, very refreshing. And perhaps for the future, we could uh, split the opinions uh, expressed in this room into several themes yeah, in order to enrich yeah, our uh, viewpoints and uh, in order for uh, young people of this world, especially in Indonesia and its surrounding countries, to work together for a better and sustainable living. And thank you, Pat Mahavan, for inviting me. Uh, we, I, I trust that, that uh, our collaboration will you know, last for another few years to come. Thank you again. My pleasure, Pa Sarawano. Okay, thank you very much again, Pa Sarwono, for your time to be here with us and distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Um, I would like to thank you to all audiences for your active participations. Uh, hopefully, our discussion could contribute positively to the movement of climate sustainability. As especially toward a healthy planet for a generation to come. Again, thank you very much. See you in another program. Wish you all healthy and joy and have a great evening ahead. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pa Sarwono, Craig, Claire, Mas Fajar, Steve, and Maria also, and also all participants. Thank you very much, Mbak Anita. Thank you, Pak Mama. Thank you, Pak Sarwono. Okay. Thank you, Pak Sarwono. Thank you, Pak Sarwono. Thank you, Pak Mahawan. Ya, terima kasih. Terima kasih, Mas Steve. Mbak Maria. Ya, thank you, Pak Mahawan. Mbak Anita, Mas Fajar. Claire, Craig, Stevie. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone.